Yeah, I need to resume my recording because I wasn't recording any of that. I'll add an addendum in the thing and I'll put the two videos together. Don't worry. That's on me. But from here, okay, we're going to do this AC method, right, that we talked about in the last class. So I'm going to do what times what gives me A times C. So 6 times a negative 3 is actually negative 18. And then I have to figure out if those numbers give me this middle guy, which is positive 7. And so now we're on the quest to find these magic numbers, right? So let's find the factors of negative 18. Um, we'll do the little square root thing, right, that we've always been doing. So square root of 18. Oh, that's not, I don't want that. I want a decimal. So I'm going to press the double arrow. Oops, this little guy. And then it should give me that decimal. So it's four point something. That's all I really wanted is that it's four point something. So when I write my list, I do need to go down to four, right? And then 18 divided by one is just 18. 18 divided by two is nine. 18 divided by three is six, and 18 divided by four is a decimal. So that's not gonna be one of my um, pairs that I can use, okay? And since after the addition, we have to end up with a positive number, that tells me that all my big numbers have to be positive. So this column will always have the same sign as that middle guy, always. Okay, then it's just a matter of figuring out what this sign has to be so that when you multiply that one, you get a negative. So if I know these guys have to be positive, but when I multiply them, it needs to come out negative, it means that the small column actually has to be negative. And then do any of those pairs add to equal seven? Uh, two and nine. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. These guys, right? So negative two plus nine, that is positive seven. Okay. So those are those magic numbers that, that we needed. Okay. And that's just my side work to figure out what the magic numbers are. Okay. Now we have to actually factor this thing. I might need some more room. So I'm going to kind of go a little wider. <laughs> But I'm going to split this guy using those magic numbers. So 6x squared stays the same. And instead of 7x, I'm going to have negative 2x and positive 9x. And then I'm going to write the last term minus 3. OK? And this is equivalent to this side of the equation, right? If I were to combine these two guys, it would be the same thing as what's up there. So I haven't changed anything, it's all still equivalent. Then we do our grouping. So I'm gonna cut this one in half. And this side, what does this side have in common? 2x. Yeah, 2x. So then when I divide by that 2x, what am I gonna get in the first spot? Three. Almost. Three. Three X. There's two, I'm gonna have an extra one, right? Because I only took out one. What about the second term? It's gonna be one. Mm -hmm. Anything divided by its exact self, right? Would just be one. Now I have to bring that plus sign down, right? That's part of the process. We have to do that. But what do the other two guys have in common? Uh, three? 
Mm -hmm. I can divide both of those by three, but no X, right? This guy doesn't have one. No. And I can't take out any X's. But yeah, they both can be divided by three. And since it's a positive three, what do you get when you divide each of these by positive three? Here you would get a positive three, but the X is still there. And here you would actually get a negative and three divided by three is just one. And then because I'm, I'm looking now, right, I'm, I'm broadening my view, I'm looking at the whole thing. What does this side and this side have in common? It's that stuff in the parentheses, right? So if I wanna factor that out, what I'm gonna end up with left over is this two X in the front and this plus three in the front. So in the other parentheses, it's gonna be the two X and then the plus three. And you could check it, right, to see if it's the correct factoring. I'm not going to do that just because I want to focus back on our actual problem, okay? But you could multiply that out and make sure that it's actually factored correctly. Now, for us, we did all this work to factor, okay? So when I come to my line, remember, this is equivalent to this, which is equivalent to that. So when I go back to my problem, now I know what those factors are. And I have factored the left-hand side of this equation. And according to that zero um, factor property, the zero factor property says, if these two things multiplied together equal zero, then the first parentheses needs to equal zero, or the second parentheses needs to equal zero, okay? That's what that zero factor property was telling us. But notice, like I mentioned over here, right? Aren't these both linear expressions now? And so we can solve those linear expressions. Now I'm trying not to run into some space over here just because I know I'm gonna need that room. But let's go ahead and solve each one. So the best way I'm gonna, cause I'm gonna recap how to solve equations. And I know you probably already know, but there might be some people that were still a little stuck on that when you were learning it, okay? So the way I explain this is you follow the order of operations when you're gonna do math, right? So the order of operations is to multiply and divide first, then add and subtract last, okay? And my biggest, um, I guess, analogy would be like, if you're going to give someone a gift, right? The first thing you do is you wrap the gift in paper. And then the second thing you do is you put the bow on top, right? So the wrapping, because that's the first thing I did, is like the multiplication. And then the second thing I did was put the bow on top. That's like your addition or your subtraction, okay? Because that's the order in which we have to do those math operations. Well, when you give the gift, you have to undo it in the opposite order, don't you? You take the bow off first. So you undo the adding or subtracting first, and then you take the paper off which would be undoing the multiplying or the dividing. So when we're trying to solve this, we're trying to get rid of the one and the three that seem to be over here attached to the X. So the X is like the gift that's inside the paper and with the bow, okay? And we need to get rid of the bow first, which was the last thing that we did to that X, which is this minus one. And so how do you get rid of minus one? You do the opposite, right? which is to add one. And whatever I do to that side, I have to do the same exact thing to the other side. So over here, negative one plus one, they just cancel. I don't have anything anymore. No ones, they're all gone. And I just have three X. And then zero plus one happens to be one. And then the last thing I need to do is to get to my gift X, I need to get rid of the wrapping paper, right? So now I need to do the opposite of what's happening here with the three. Well, this is actually multiplication going on. 
So the opposite of multiplication is to divide. So I have to divide by that three. And again, what I do to one side of the equation, I have to do it to the other. That's how you keep it equal, okay? So now these will cancel or reduce, and I'll have the X by itself. This does not reduce or simplify or look any nicer. So it's just gonna stay like that. And I do have, you know, X is equal to one third. So that's one solution, okay? But you still have a whole nother equation to solve. So we'll probably get a second solution, okay? So here, since I'm adding three, I'm actually gonna take away three on both sides and that will cancel those, giving my two X all by itself, but zero take away three is actually negative three. And then to undo the multiplication going on in between these guys, we'll actually do division, the opposite of multiplication. So those will wipe out, giving us X by itself, and over here, this does not simplify or do anything nice. So it just stays X equal to negative three halves, okay? And so then those are our answers. Now, how you type them in the computer depends. If the computer says like this, then you could just type in one third comma like that. If it asks you to write the solution in a solution set, I've seen that happen too. I've seen that vocabulary. All that means is that you're gonna put the answers inside some braces. I also call them squigglies, okay? They, they look like this to be more formal, but I can never draw that like perfect. <laughs> so normally I just put squiggles on the sides and that's what it is, okay? Um, but it is should be a brace is what they call it. It's their braces. So definitely, definitely is making us bring back what we learned right from the previous um, section. Okay, for the second problem, the equation also has an X squared, right? So we know it's a quadratic. There's no other powers higher than the X squared. No like three powers or four powers or any other bigger power. Um, so we do need to get it equal to zero. The issue here this time though, is that my X squared is on this side, but I have two people, two terms on the other side. So I need to move them both over, okay? And so I'm gonna end up having to um, subtract two on both sides. And I'm gonna end up having to do the opposite there, which is add X on both sides. And so that should move the two guys over. And so if I wanna keep it in the nice, neat quadratic order, I have to put my X squareds in the front, then my X is next, and then my constants last. And that keeps it in the right order, okay? Now here though, two take away two is zero. And negative X plus X means there's no more Xs. So I do truly have nothing or zero on the right-hand side now. And then here you would factor, now because we are you know, limited with the amount of time that we have, I'm not gonna do the whole process. I'll leave you to do that. Just make sure that when you do try to do the process with this problem, that you get what I'm about to write down, okay? So if I were to factor this, this would be 5x, times two X and then I would have two and one and I need a positive one when I'm done. So this one will be positive and this one will be negative. Now, again, you might not be able to do that. So do this <laughs> instead, okay? But that is the factorization for that uh, quadratic, okay? So if you were to do all of this, you would get this exact same thing. Or you might get the two bubbles in reverse, right? But as long as 2x plus 1 is in the front and 5x minus 2 is in the back, it's exactly the same thing, okay? But once it's factored, okay, 
once it's factored, then you can set each factor equal to zero. So we would take this factor equal to zero, and we would take this factor equal to zero. And then I would do my same step. So I would add two first. This is now gone. And zero plus two is two. And then I would divide by my five on both sides. Now the five is gone and I have X equal to this fraction. And then similarly, the same thing on the other side, right? So I'd minus one on both sides. This would go away. Zero take away one is negative one. And then I would divide both sides by two which makes the two go away. And then I finally have X all by itself, but I have negative one half on the other side, okay? And so then our answer would be the fraction two fifths or the fraction negative one half. And if it asks me for a solution set, then you just put it in the braces. But if it just has X equal and then a box, then that's all you need to type in the box, okay? But if it says these words, solution set, then you put them in braces. And the braces are in your um, keypad. You have to press shift and then the braces are next to the P on the P on the keypad. So again, remember, there's a whole bunch of steps, right? From here to here, I just didn't go over them. So you definitely have to do that AC method right there, from there to there, okay? There are some of you that already know how to factor. And for those of you that already know, like, you know, all the tips and tricks and you can factor anything, any quadratic, um, you can just go from here to here if you know how to do that, okay? I don't need to see all of this if you know how to factor trinomials. Okay. This is just like a, a backup plan for those that are not great at factoring uh, trinomials just yet. Okay, now for part C, it's the same thing, except for we learned at the very, I would say like in the middle of the last class, we learned about how to factor um, a difference of two perfect squares. And in the way we factored that, it was different than this AC method stuff. It just was completely different. All we did was say, oh, well, the square root of X squared is X and the square root of nine, that happens to be three. And so then we said that this factored into X plus three and then X minus three. So the factoring part is gonna be the hard part. The rest of it is not that bad because you're just applying that zero factor property, right? So when you apply the zero factor property, you're basically just setting the first bubble equal to parentheses and then the second bubble equal, not parentheses, first bubble equal to zero, then the second bubble equal to zero. And so those, we actually don't have any multiplication going on with X, right? We just have the add and subtract. So we'll do the opposite on both sides, the same. So now that guy's gone and I have X all alone and this is negative three. Over here, we'll do the opposite and add three and do the same on the other side to keep everything equivalent. That'll make those go away. And then zero plus three is just three. So again, your answer will be negative three comma three. Or if it says those words, solution set, it would be squiggly negative three comma three and then close the squiggle. I know in the my math lab, they're different sometimes. So sometimes they'll ask you for just the numbers and then sometimes they ask you for that solution set, okay? 
So I just wrote both so that you have them, right? Does anybody have any questions so far? Because this is one of those, uh, it's really like three methods, but one of those methods to solve. This one's the zero factor property method. So the struggle here is probably not gonna be applying the zero factor property. The struggle is gonna be the factoring, right? <laughs> That's the hard part of it, the long part of it, okay? So keep practicing this. There are some problems in the homework that ask you to do the zero factor property and you'll get some more practice with these outside of that factoring. Uh, R.4 section. Okay. We will be factoring throughout the entire semester. Okay. So, unfortunately, factoring is not, I know, because I used to do it too. Sometimes I would just learn something just well enough to get by <laughs> that one particular section and whatnot. Um, and I wouldn't really like commit it fully to memory. I would just be like, okay, I just got to get through this one test and I'm good. I can forget whatever I just learned. But unfortunately, factoring is not one of those things. We will literally do it for the rest of the semester, okay? So you definitely want to get practice with those guys. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and start talking about the next um, method to solving quadratics. And that one is called the square root property, okay? So, the square root property is there in the box, and it says that if x squared is equal to a number, then your answers are basically going to be x equal to the square root of that number, or x equal to the negative square root of that number, okay? Now, what I wanted you to see was what it looked like if you were solving the problem, okay? So if you had an equation like this, where you had x squared equal to a number, remember, in order for you to get x by itself, right, to get to that gift inside the gift wrap, you have to undo what's happening to that x. And in this case, we're squaring an x. And the way you undo an exponent is to apply the same kind of uh, radical. So if I have a square exponent, I wanna do the square radical or the square root is what you're used to hearing, right? So if I applied that square root symbol on both sides, yes, the square root undoes the square, leaving me with just the X. But what happens over here is you actually get plus or minus whatever that number is, whatever the square root of that number is. Um, and I'll give you an example. Okay, and so that I can explain why it's plus or minus, because it doesn't make sense when there's not actually a number there. So let's say I had x squared equal to uh, four. If I were to take the square root of both sides of this equation, I get x all by itself, and then the square root of four in my calculator is two. However, two, when I go back to try to check it, yeah, if I take two squared, I do get four. But there's actually another number that if I square it, I also get four. And that's actually negative two. Because when you do negative two times itself, you also get a positive four. Okay? So both of these numbers are actually solutions, not just one of them. Even though my calculator will only tell me this one. I have to remember that there's also its negative version, okay? And that's essentially what this rule is telling me. It's telling me that not only is that number your answer, but you also need to have the negative of that answer. So you could write them separately like I did here. Another way you can write them is just to put that little plus or minus symbol in front and then the number. And it's basically like telling you both numbers at the same time, okay? So for example A, there's a whole bunch of these because they all look a lot different, right? Especially these down here at the bottom. They're all different, they're all weird, okay? For this one, if I take the square root on both sides, 
I know that it's going to make the little square go away on the left-hand side. But I have to remember that on the right-hand side, I'm going to get plus or minus. That's the key, is that you have to remember that. Anytime you apply a square root on both sides, you will have plus or minus where the number is at. Unfortunately, though, square root of 17 is not a number that, that um, simplifies. My calculator just spit out the exact same thing because it cannot simplify. And I noticed that in the web, in the my math lab, um, it doesn't tell you to round your answer or nothing. So when it doesn't ask you to round, I can't hit the double arrow because I don't know where this number stops. It does keep going. It's just my calculator only gives me so many digits, okay? And if you chop it off at some point, you are rounding. And if it never said any instructions to round, then you need to give them what's called the exact answer. And so the exact answer is this weird square root of 17. So unfortunately, I can't simplify that. It's just gonna stay square root of 17. So if they tell you in the directions to write in your answers using a comma to separate your answers, then you'll essentially enter one of them as a positive and then the other one as a negative, okay? And those will be your two answers. It just doesn't simplify this square root of 17. Okay, I'm actually gonna move to part D first before I talk about part B. And the reason why is because this is gonna require a concept that we literally have not learned yet. So I don't know, I know why it's in here because we're also supposed to cover a section called R.5, I think, which is complex numbers. And we will get to it eventually, but right now you're just gonna have to believe me when I tell you something, <laughs> we'll get to it in a minute. But when we get to R.5, we'll get to talk about it way much more, okay? It's just when the, the faculty in the department set out the schedule for this class, they put this section first before R.5, but there's a tiny little bits of R.5 that are actually used in this section. So it might not make sense right now. I'll just need you to believe me what I'm saying is true when I get to this one. Um, but then after that, we will learn more about complex numbers later, okay? But for now, I'm gonna go to this one here. So this one here is not ready for me to do the square root on both sides because I don't have the x squared by itself, okay? So, and I also want x squared to be positive, not negative, right? This is minus x squared. So that means that the x squared is negative. So what I'm gonna actually do is if it's negative and I want it positive is I'm gonna add x squared to both sides so that it'll cancel over here, right? And I'll have 25, but then over here, zero plus x squared was gonna be x squared. And now, although it doesn't look exactly like what it looks like up here, it is the same thing, right? It's like a, like in science, when you have the balance beam and the two objects are, are equal, right? But I'm standing on this side of the balance beam versus me, if I were standing on the other side of the balance beam, the two sides would look different. They would be like reversed, right? If I was on the other side of the balance beam. So this is the exact same thing as this. There's no difference. They're both still equal, aren't they? Okay. So I can do my square root on both sides here. When I do that, that's going to get rid of the little square. But then I have to remember that I will have plus or minus the square root of 25. And I actually do know what the square root of 25 is. And if, if you don't know, you can always type it in here. And it does come out like a nice little number, right? And notice there's no house on this number. So don't put one when you write it down, okay? I typed in square root of 25, but it just gave me five. 
that has, I can't even tell you how many times that has happened to me in my past that students will do this and then they'll tell me it's two point something. They just keep taking square roots and you can't, there was only one square root, only take the square root once, right? Um, I, I can't even tell you how many times that happens. They just keep doing it over and over and over again. So I thought it was worth mentioning, don't do it just once. And if there's no house around the answer they give you, don't put a house around the answer they give you, okay? They being the calculator. Okay, so then here, that means my answers would be positive five and then negative five. And again, if these problems happen to say those words solution set, you would just put braces around the numbers, okay? Okay, this next one is weird. I know it is. And we're I'm looking at the time here and we, I'm sure we'll get through these. I don't know how much further we'll get in the process. So if we have to continue the next class period, it's perfectly okay, okay? I don't ever try to rush anything. I wanna make sure that we have time to see it all. Um, so I don't do that. <laughs> Some teachers try to just cram it all in or be like, oh, well, you can figure out the rest. I, I That's just not my style, so I won't do that, okay? So in part B now, it is set up for me to do the square root property, right? It has X squared equal to a number. So when I go to do the square root over here, okay? The X will come out just like it had been coming out of the square root. The problem is, is I get this plus or minus square root of negative 25. And when I go into my calculator and I try to type in square root of negative 25, um, it tells me that, okay? There is no actual number for the square root of negative 25. And the reason why is because there is no such number that if I take it and I multiply it by itself, I will end up with a negative number ever. Because if it's the exact same number, aren't they both gonna be negative or both gonna be positive, right? And when I multiply two negatives together, I get a positive. And when I multiply two positives, I get a positive. So there's absolutely no way that I can square a number and end up with a negative, okay? Those numbers, I don't want to say they don't exist because they do. <laughs> they are just called imaginary, okay? <laughs> so that's the what all of R.5 is going to be about is those imaginary numbers, okay? And in that section, you're going to learn a little rule, and that's the rule that I'm going to apply right now, even though we haven't gone in depth about complex numbers yet, okay? So we will talk a whole bunch about complex numbers when we get to R.5, but for right now, we're just gonna use one of those little tiny rules, okay? And the rule is, is that if you have a number like this, a negative, the square root of a negative number, the negative will essentially come out as an imaginary unit, okay? And then you're just taking the square root of the regular number, the positive version of that number. Okay, so in this particular example, the way that's going to look is behind the signs, this little I unit will come out, and then I'll just have the square root of 25. Okay, and that I can type in my calculator, and since I've already done it, I got just regular 5, didn't I? We did it right there and we just got regular five. But to be formal here, they don't like it like this. Like if you had X times five, you don't leave it like that, right? You write five X. So it's the same thing here. I have to write five I, okay? And so you do have two answers. You have positive five I and then you have negative five I. And again, that I is this imaginary unit, okay? Just to explain it a tiny bit more, I is equal to the square root of negative one. 
And so what happens here with this guy is you essentially tear it apart into negative one times that number. And then you separate the radicals. And then that guy, since it's defined as this I unit, it turns to the I, okay? So that's what's happening behind the scenes from here to here, okay? Is all those properties of radicals, okay? Again, we'll talk about it. We'll probably repeat all the same stuff when we get to that section, but we'll definitely talk more about these I's and all of that good stuff, okay? For now, I just need to know that one little fact. But if I have a square root of a negative, the little negative symbol will come out as an I unit, okay? So now we definitely want to talk about um, C, E, and F because they all look kind of similar. Of course, they're not the same, right? They all have different things going on, um, but they kind of look similar, okay? And they have like a whole expression being squared instead of just the X being squared, okay? But this X literally stands for any expression. It doesn't have to be just the expression X all by himself squared, okay? It could be any expression with X that's being squared, okay? So this counts as an expression with X. This in here counts as an expression with X, and so does this one. So as long as we have that squared thing on one side and the number on the other side, we can still do that square root of both sides, okay? So essentially what you wanna do is you wanna get rid of this guy before you can get rid of the minus four, okay? So if I wanna get rid of the square, I have to do that square root on both sides. And so the little root, the little two will go away and I'll just have X minus four. And since it's not squared anymore, there's really no purpose to have the parentheses anymore, okay? The parentheses were there to tell you that the whole thing was being squared, okay? But since it's not being squared anymore, I don't need those parentheses anymore, okay? And over here though, remember when you took the square root of that number, it turns into plus or minus, right? Now, I do think that that square root of 12 simplifies, this one's just interesting because it doesn't simplify nicely as we would like it to simplify. It's not a square root of 25, that's for sure. It square root of 12 simplifies, but it's not pretty, right? It's not just a two or a three or something nice. It's this weird radical expression. That's fine. Whatever it is, it is, right? You just write it down. That's the thing about math. People want it to look a certain way and then sometimes it doesn't, right? And then that makes y'all second guess yourself and think, oh no, it's not right. That's not true. It's just weird. <laughs> and it's okay if it comes out weird, okay? Um, I can't do anything with that because <laughs> I don't know what else to do. It's just gonna stay stuck as two square root of three. But I have not solved for X. In all these other problems, we always have X all by itself equal to something, right? And in this one, I don't. So I need to make it like that. So what I'm gonna do is get rid of this minus four by adding four to both sides. And here's where it's gonna get even weirder, okay? So that will make this go away. And then I'll finally have my little X all by himself. But here I really have two different problems, to be honest with you. Okay, because this is two different numbers, isn't it? So really what you have is you have two square root of three plus four, but then you also have negative two square root of three plus four. You have two separate things, okay? And you cannot combine those. You could try. If I do two square root of three, get out of the house and then do a plus four, Notice that it doesn't change the answer because it does not simplify anymore, okay? Your calculator will simplify it. If you type in anything, it will automatically try to reduce it and simplify it always, okay? And this one just does not simplify or reduce. So these do happen to be your two answers. As weird as they look, there, that's it, okay? If the computer does tell you to round, because sometimes it might, 
round to, I'm just going to make up something, maybe round to three decimal places. If it does say to do that, you must, okay? So you can't enter this. It won't accept it. It'll keep telling you, nope. So what we do is we hit this double arrow to give us the decimal representation of that number. So if I hit my double arrow, this first one, three places, well, that one will not change the four. So it will just stay 7.464. Then you would have to type in the other one and see what decimal that one is, okay? So now I'm going to do negative 2 square root of 3, get out of the house, so hit the right arrow, and now the little house is not on top of my little blinking cursor. Now I can hit the plus 4. And then when I hit enter, again, it doesn't simplify, so it gives me that again, but I can hit the double arrow, and it'll change it to a decimal. So this one. Three decimal places puts me here, but that eight is bigger than it's five or more, right? So it will make this go up to a six. So it'll actually be 0 0.536, okay? So if it tells you to round, right, make sure that you do the double arrow to get those decimal versions. So we've seen when they when they, the radicals don't simplify, we've seen when the radicals do simplify, we've seen when the radicals are actually imaginary, right? And we've seen when they don't simplify and they're even more complex than that up there in part A, okay? So you're kind of starting to see like all the different kinds of answers you could have, okay? We still have two more scenarios <laughs> to, to talk about here, okay? So for part E, it does have the whole thing, right, with the square equal to a number. That's all I need to apply the square root property it is a whole expression with the square equal to just a regular number. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do that square root on both sides here. And it will make the little two go away. So then there's no point to having a parentheses anymore. But because I took the square root, I automatically have that plus or minus thing. And if I try my calculator, square root of 33, um, it just pops out exactly the same. So it's not going to simplify at all, okay? So I'm kind of like in the same boat as I was over here. The difference is, is that this one had a number in front of X, whereas this one did not have a number in front of X, okay? So just like I moved that four over, I'm gonna have to do the same thing with my three, right? I have to move that three over. So I am gonna add the three, um, and I just like to put it underneath. But really what you have is two different equations. You have two X equal to, sorry, um, positive square root of 33 plus a three, and then you have negative square root of 33 plus a three. So those are the two separate answers, right? One with a positive radical and then one with a negative radical. And both of them have a plus three. But I still don't have X all by itself, right? So we have to still solve for X. So we'll do the opposite of multiplication, which is to divide, but we have two answers, don't we? So we need to make sure we divide both of those by this two and take that whole weird number and divide it by two. The whole weird number and divide it by two. And you can try in your calculator to simplify it. Like I always try, because sometimes they do. So I hit fraction and then I'm gonna do square root of 33, go to the side, plus three, go to the bottom and put in two but it doesn't simplify, okay? And then if you wanted, you could type in the other, this fraction exactly like it is, and it would also stay exactly the same. So then those just happen to be our answers. As weird as they look, this just it, okay? 
And if you're doing a word problem, they're most likely, if that's your answer after doing a word problem, they're probably going to want decimals, right? Um, so again, if they happen to ask you for the decimals, that's where the little double arrows come in, okay? So this would be um, approximately 4.372. And then if I did the other one, negative square root of 33, get out, plus 3 over 2. If I did the double arrow on that one, I get negative 1.372. Okay, so it just depends. If they tell you to round, these are your answers. If they never mention anything about rounding, then you have to leave them looking weird, okay? What you definitely cannot do, unless your calculator does it, and it probably won't, is don't try to add the 33 and the three together, okay? because one has a house on it and the other one doesn't. So they're not the same kind of people, okay? So you cannot put them together. So the last one that we have here, um, let's see how I'm doing on time. Yeah, we'll probably just cover this one and then call it a day. So for this one, Again, you still have, right, your big expression with the little square equal to a number. Still the same scenario. So we're going to do our little square root on both sides. And then that will make the little square go away. So I just have x plus 2 all by itself. And I do have to remember that square root property says when I put the square roots here, I am going to get plus or minus. It's just automatic, okay? You have to have the plus or minus. Then I do see that negative on the inside, right? Like we did over here. So the little negative will come out of the house, but the signs still go in the front. So it'll be I, and then the square root is 16. And then I know that the square root of 16 is four. If you don't know, quote unquote, no, you can always type in the calculator, right? but it does tell you it's four. So this is actually I times four, which I'm gonna skip that step and I'm just gonna write four I, right? Because the square root of the 16 is four and I times four is four I. Oh, why does the I go outside of the... Um, right uh, here, this is why. Mm-hmm. Because the negative number can be written as negative one times the positive of that number. And then you can split a radical when you're multiplying inside. So you could do the radical of negative one times the radical of A. And since the definition of negative square root of one is I, notice that the I is now in the front, isn't it? Okay. Good, good, good. We're not done, though, quite yet, right? Because we still don't have x all alone. I have a question. Sure. So why didn't we solve for x before making it imaginary? Um, you definitely want to simplify your expression over here, whatever it is. You always want to simplify it before you start trying to solve, OK? Even when I had something like this, my goal is to make sure that this can get simplified first before I start messing around with continuing to solve for x. You basically want to see what do you really have over there on that other side before you start trying to keep solving. It wouldn't be wrong to do it. It's just you would then have to rewrite it twice, right? Because if I do it here and I minus two, I'm going to have basically square root of this plus minus two. I'll erase all of this, but I'm just going to write it down for a point, okay? Then I would have negative square root of this minus two. And then now I have to do these steps twice, right? <laughs> I'm going to have to do it over here and over there on each step. So it's just a little less writing if you simplify it first. Okay. But good question. Good, good, good. I'm glad you guys are asking questions. So now that I have this side, like all nice and neat is 
pretty as it's gonna get, right? I can finally continue solving for X. So this guy is gone now. And then I'm gonna have positive four I minus two, and then I'm gonna have negative four I minus two, okay? Now, this is also something that you will learn. Your computer will take this, okay? It won't tell you it's wrong. It's perfectly fine. Um, but when we do get to that um, complex number section, they will tell you that the formal way to write a complex number is to always put the regular number first and then put the i's after it, okay? Um, so in this case, if I wanted to be formal, I would actually be writing the negative two in the front and then the positive four i in the back. And the same thing here, the negative two in the front and then the negative four i in the back, okay? This is just the more formal way to write it. And instead of saying way to write, <laughs> mathematicians use this word notation. Notation is just the way you write it, okay? So they're both correct. I could have typed this in my answer box and the thing would have given me a big, yay, you got it. But this is the more formal way. So the reason why I mentioned this is because let's say you're taking a multiple choice test, right? The answers are not gonna look like this, okay? Because that's not the formal way to write the answers. The answers would look like this one, okay? And you would need to know that they're actually the same exact thing, okay? But again, we're gonna get more into this, this formal notation stuff and a bunch of other things we do with these imaginaries um, when we get to that R.5 section. There's a lot more going on, but we're just barely kind of um, getting the tip of the iceberg there, okay? Um, so the completing the square, actually, I know I'm not gonna cover it, but the completing the square was one of the other topics up here. We actually don't do completing the square in this class. I promise you that is a saving grace because <laughs> that process is crazy, okay? So I'm glad that we don't have to do that one in this class because it's, it's kind of a lot, okay? Um, but I definitely don't want to. So the next page, I just have it all scribbled out because we just don't do that in the class. You see all these steps? No, no, thank you, right? <laughs> so it's a little lengthy, okay? But we're not going to do that in this one, okay? So the next one is actually the quadratic formula. If you know something about it, you should be able to do the homework section. If you don't know about this quadratic formula or you're a little bit confused about it, I would just wait, okay? Um, because we will finish 1.4. And so I think right now I might have 1.4 due um, Friday. But if I do, I'm going to have to fix that because I don't ever make something due until after we have completely covered um, the whole section. Okay. So I'll go look as soon as we exit out of here and I'll make sure that uh, 1.4 is not due on Friday. And if it is, I will push it back. Okay. So that way we can finish this section and then you guys have all the tools you need to go do the homework, okay? Does anybody have any questions so far about what we have covered? Okay, okay. Well then we will continue with 1.4 the next class period. And then if we still have some time, like a good chunk of time, we'll start with the next section, which I think is 1.6. So let me close my visualizer real quick and go examine our, our calendar. I'm teaching seven classes, so excuse me for real, but <laughs> I just don't remember what all is going on. I just prep for the next class period and I'm like, okay, I know what I'm gonna talk about today. And then, then that's it. So let me go to your syllabus and your schedule. So yeah, we're supposed to start one point. Notice I gave us two days anyway. So we got a little bit of overage from 1.4. That's okay, because I already gave us two days to cover 1.6 anyway, okay? And if we have to use the third day or oh, well, whatever, we'll use it, okay? Um, 
but we definitely, I need to push this because it should not be due on Friday. Okay. So I'll probably make it due uh, the following week, which is going to be on the ninth. Okay. Okay. Well, then that's all I have for you today. I'm still going to be here. We still have nine minutes of class time. So if you want to hang back and ask me questions, you can. But other than that, you guys are dismissed for the day. Have a good day. You too. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.